Um, so my name is Judith and I'm a storyteller. And I came here to tell you why I think that stories are very important. I apologize. English bilmeyenler için çok özür dilerim. Um, so, like many children, I grew up in a world that was magical, in an enchanted world. I remember that when I was 16, each and every one of my morning would start with a bike ride through the forest, because that's where my high school was. And each morning I would connect to the forest and to how it felt to be there. Each season had a different smell. Fall smelled sweet, like the earth was saying goodbye for the entire winter. And as I rode my bike in fall, the leaves, they would crackle and sing under my, my wheels, and I'd get so excited. And I remember that the leaves were flying left and right like a thousand fairies. And some cold mornings, I would pass this lake, and the lake in a cold morning was steaming over like white fog. And I'd think that witches had been dancing around this boiling cauldron all night, and they had left it still warm for me to find in the morning. Then winter would come and cover nature with a white blanket, like putting it to bed. Time would go by, and one day, on my way to school, I would see the first flowers breaking through the crust of snow. And I would know that spring, this charming prince, had come and kissed nature's white lips and brought her back to life. I would carry with me the secret to class that we had pulled it through, that once again, Winter was going to go, and spring was going to come back. I, I grew up in a commune of weavers, where each day ended with stories by the fireside. Stories were woven into me, sang into me, so much so that everything I saw, everything I felt, connected to me through bubbles of images, and these bubbles of images, they would connect like chains into stories, and all stories flow naturally to the ocean stream of stories, which is this wide pond of symbolic knowledge that was carried all the way to today by all the generations that came before, all the stories, all the fairy tales, all the myths that have been told over and over again and that are still alive today. Then, of course, I grew up, and I went to college, and I moved to the big city, and I decided to be a rational and reasonable adult. And for me, the big city was Paris, but it could have been any big city. It could have been Istanbul, because when I went there, all I saw was the subway. I would wake up, and I would go down the stairs, and I would ride the subway, and then I would get up the stairs, but I would be too tired, I'd take the... Uh, escalator, and I'd go to class, and I'd take lots of notes, and I'd listen to people, and then I'd go back down to the subway, and then back home, and then back down the subway. And after about one month of this, I felt exhausted and drained, because for one month, I hadn't seen trees, and I hadn't felt the wind on my face. And so I did what any newly reasonable adult would do, and which you may have done uh, when you came to college, is that I, I called my mother and I whined. I called her and I said, I hate the city, I hate living here, it's terrible, I hate the subway. The people in the subway, they see you, but they pretend they don't, and they are there, but they pretend they're not, and I feel like I'm a coal miner going underground all the time. I feel like a character from the film Metropolis, you know, like with the army of zombies, you know, going to work. I hate it, I just hate it. My mom said, well, if you hate riding the subway, why don't you ride your bike? No, why don't you ride your bike? 
I said, well, Mom, I can't ride my bike because it's not reasonable. It's dangerous. It rains all the time. There's crazy traffic. It takes too much time. I'm going to get my bike stolen after a week. Uh, I can't buy a new bike every week. And she said, oh, you don't have to do what's reasonable. You just have to do what's right. So I rode my bike. At the time, riding the bike in Paris, if you go to Paris now, it's wonderful. But at the time, there were no bike lanes, and most cars really aimed at trying to kill you. I mean, I, they, they, like, I remember we'd stop at the red light, and like, we'd meet, there were a few bikers, and people would say, you bike, and I'd say, yes, I bike, and they'd say, yeah, we bike, you know? It was like this, this crazy thing, and like, we'd go into it, and most of my friends thought that it was suicide. They're like, Judith, you have to stop this. You know, you're not dead yet, say thank you, and then, you know, take the subway. But none of this mattered to me, because the moment I stepped into traffic with my bike, I was the minnow in the stream. I was the smallest fish in the river. And the taxis, they were the sharks. They were trying to get me, because that's what sharks do. They try to get the small fish, but I was faster. And I'd swerve out of the way, and then I'd keep riding, and the buses, they were like whales. They moved so much air that they created a wake that I could ride into. And then there was like the army of gray and black cars, the tuna fish going home slowly. And there was the clownfish, the motorcycle like going between. It was wild in there. I loved being there. It was magical. And then when they were passing this bridge, and from under the bridge, I saw this touristic boat. And don't make fun of me, but I saw it as a flying dragon. And uh, in that moment, I knew I was back in the enchanted world that I grew up in. So I went home really excited. I took a paintbrush, and on my wall, I wrote, beyond the shadows of reality lies the colorful world of your fancy. I was really excited. I was 19. I discovered something. I felt that there were two realities. The reality that we call reality, the rational, reasonable, tangible, measurable world. And then another reality that was stories, myth, imagination, creativity, metaphors, symbols, and that it was also real. Of course, there's nothing new under the sun. So the pre-modern people, they already knew this. That's how they saw the world. Pre-modern people really thought there was two ways of thinking, speaking, and perceiving the world. The Greeks called this mythos and logos. So logos is logic, rational, reasonable thinking, and mythos, that's myth, it's stories, it's metaphors. The thing is that we as modern people, we have cut one of the branches of this tree of knowledge. We still use stories, but we don't believe the insights that we have from them. We don't think it's serious to tell stories. We don't think it, it's reliable. In fact, we say it's a myth to say it's not true, right? When you say it's a myth, it's thing, you mean that's not real. Disregard any information that we get from the world of stories and symbols. And I always I've been pushing ever since to, to believe in this, but most people tell me, well, Judith, we live in a very complex world. We have some very serious decisions to make. No, we don't have any time to waste with like stories. How do you want us to make decisions in this very complex world based on myth, which is not true anyway? So um, we don't have any time to waste with this. And, and it's true. You will never have a hero in a fairy tale make a five-year plan or a 10-year plan to reach their goal. But what's also true is that heroes of fairy tales don't wait five years knowing they have something to do and not doing it. What heroes do is that the moment they see there's something that needs to be done, they go and they start doing it. These are a very traditional format, a very traditional motif of tales in which three brothers will go and seek something. Depending on the version, they might look for different things. For example, they can look for a blue flower to heal their father. 
And the two first heroes, the two first brothers, one by one, they will go. The first brother will go, the second brother will go, and the third one, the youngest one, who's always the hero, will go in last. And the first two brothers, they use logos thinking to try to get this blue flower. They don't know anything about the blue flower. They've been told it might exist, but they've never seen it. No one has ever seen it. They don't have any information about it. They're not even completely sure it exists. But still, they want to use rational, logical thinking to get there. And they go, and they have this goal, and they make this plan, and they only focus on the goal. Anything else, they disregard. Anyone on the path that does not lead them to the goal, they don't pay attention to. Whatever happens on the road until the blue flower, none of it matters. If it helps them to get the blue flower, they're for it. If it doesn't, they don't care. If they break things on the way, it doesn't matter. All that matters is the goal. This is our society. This is us today. We set goals, and we go after them no matter what. So, for example, when the heroes, the first two brothers, they, they meet on the road an old lady, and the old lady needs something. She's rolling a heavy stone, or she has this bucket, and she says, can you fetch some water and light my fire or something? They go, lady, I'm sorry, I can't catch it. I can't get water for you. I can't light fire for you. I'm the hero of the story, and I'm getting the blue flower, and you get out of my way. They will not help her because she does not seem to be contributing to the final goal. She's just this old thing on the road. And the old lady will say, what are you seeking? And they will say, well, nothing. Not because they're seeking nothing, but because they think, what does this woman know about the blue flower? And so the woman will say, then nothing is what you will find. And they find nothing. They don't make it. But then the youngest one, the youngest one, he meets the old lady. And she doesn't have to ask anything. He sees her with the bucket, and he says, hey, let me fill your bucket with water. And then she says, can you light the fire? He says, sure. Whatever she asks, you know, scratch my back, get the fleas out of my hair, he'll do it. He'll do it not because he thinks that she will help him get the blue floor. He does it because she is on his path. And the heroes, whatever is on their path, they interact with. Not because they think it's going to help them for the final goal, but because being on the path to something that you don't really know means that every step, what you meet, you interact with. Every step, what you do, you try to do as beautifully and as heartfully uh, as possible. And because she is the thing in the present, she is the task at hand, she is here and the blue flower is not, then he will fetch the water, he will light the fire, and she will say to him, what do you seek? And he will say, I seek a blue flower to heal my father. Not because he thinks she can help, but because he discounts and disregards the knowledge of no one. Everyone he interacts with, he interacts with as who he is and what he seeks. And she will tell him, she will tell him, oh, the blue flower, I know where it is. She'll give him a map, she'll give him the magical object that will help him get there. Heroes interact with everything on the path, not because of some rational, utilitarian way, but because they are the thing in the present and because they can't use rational thought to get to somewhere that they have never seen. Then later, the same three brothers will find themselves in front of three doors, and two of the doors will look amazing, like golden. They will say, I'm the door that leads to the place you want to go. They will look princely and rich, and then there'll be this third door that looks dark and covered in thorns and, um, and looks scary. And the first two brothers, of course, they will go through the golden doors because they use their mind and they think that's what the good door should look like. They think that their preconceived ideas about the blue flower can help them get there. But the third hero, he does not know. 
And so he will, he will interact with what is. And if in front of the door there is like a dog, he will feed the dog. If in front of the door there is an old woman, he'll talk again with the old woman. He would love to talk with the old woman. Uh, he'll do in the moment. And in this moment, he will choose the door. And you can be sure it will be the dark door covered in thorns that he will choose. He will go through a difficult path and you will think, I'm not getting anywhere. But then that path will open to the garden where the blue flower go grows. Eleven years ago, I found myself in front of three doors. I had just graduated, I had my master's in my pocket, I had studied theater and storytelling, and I really wanted to have a career with storytelling. I wanted to spread the stories, the old tales, the myth, I wanted to share this. And I was hesitant between two golden doors. I could stay in France, where I had a lot of contacts with the storytelling community because I grew up in this world, uh, or I could move to the States, where the storytelling world was very vibrant. And then someone told me, why don't you go to Turkey? And um, at the time, it, it felt like the right thing. But logically, everything told me it was the wrong thing if I wanted to tell stories, because I did not speak Turkish, so I could not tell stories. And the storytelling revival had not happened in Turkey. And so uh, when I, I went there, even though in Anatolia, stories were once very vibrant, no one was telling stories there at the time. But I went to Turkey because at the time, it was the right door. And for the longest time, logically, it felt like the wrong decision. Everybody told me it was, and it felt like this, because I was tongue-tied, I couldn't tell my stories, because I was in the desert in terms of storytelling, because there was no one telling stories around me. And I tended to what was present. I worked at the Middle East Technical University, I did other things with great joy, and then I started telling stories again. And people told me, oh, that's very nice. Why don't you come and tell stories there? And I told stories there. And then they said, oh, why don't you tell stories in this festival? And I did. And then people said, well, how do you tell stories? Can you teach this? And I said, oh, yes, I can. I've learned this, and this is something that can be taught. And so they said, oh, can you come and teach us how to tell stories? So I started giving workshops. People liked this, and they invited me to more places. But I realized people were afraid of telling stories because of the dark symbols in traditional tales. So I worked with psychologists on the healing power of stories, and then I worked with uh, folkloric departments to train a new generation of storytellers, and they went to schools, and they went to hospitals, and they started telling stories that once were alive in Anatolia, and that had been forgotten. And this just grew to a place that I could have never imagined. All of a sudden, after taking the dark door, I found myself in the garden of stories that needed tending, tending and I was one of the gardeners. I was lucky enough to be one of the initiator of the revival of storytelling in Turkey. I have now trained over 250 storytellers that go in many different places and tell stories that had been forgotten once. I go to schools of education and I talk to the teachers about the, the power of stories. And no one could have told me that this was possible if I had used my logical, rational thinking to make my decisions. So what I came here to say today is that we need to believe in stories. We need to reconnect not just the body-mind connection, but the body-story connection. We need to connect our sensations, what we see, hear, and feel, to the metaphors and to the stories that come from the ocean of stream of stories, this large pond of symbolic knowledge that came to us from our ancestors. Because if we believe in stories and we connect to them in this way, then we can take our place as the heroes of our own story. And we can connect to the world as the magical, awe-inspiring, enchanting place that it is. And if we live in this way, then every day we spend, we think, how can I contribute to the magical garden? How can I help tend, protect, and create more beauty in the place I am in. So I'm asking, as you go today in this magical garden, what seed do you want to plant? What tree do you want to tend? Thank you. <laughs>